I'd like to begin this last session, which is entitled The Eclipse of God, by reading a brief passage from the Old Testament from the book of the prophet Isaiah, beginning at verse of chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, and reading through verse 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, and with two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of His glory. It's only a guess, but I assume that I have preached on this chapter in Isaiah more than from any other text in the Bible over the course of many, many years. And normally, when I look at this text, I focus attention on the manifestation of the holiness of God and the response of the seraphim to it and also of the prophet Isaiah to it. But this afternoon, I'm going to look at a, an aspect I rarely make much mention of in those discourses which I will do, God willing, as soon as we pray. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, now as we contemplate the hiddenness of Your glory from our sight in this day, I pray that You would indulge us with Your mercy by granting us the illumination of the Holy Spirit of truth. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. It was quite a treat for me, at least, to hear Dr. Morales go through those marvelous texts of the Old Testament showing the significance of the tabernacle as it related to Eden and then pushing forward to the incarnation in which the Lord Jesus tabernacled or pitched His tent, as it were, among us. And when Dr. Morales spoke of the Old Testament tabernacle and the Shekinah and the cloud and the glory, he used one word very frequently in that address. Before I tell you what that word was, I'm going to suggest what it wasn't first. When he spoke of the <clears throat> glory entering into the tabernacle, he didn't say that the glory of God touched the tabernacle. He didn't say that the glory of God entered the tabernacle or merely visited the tabernacle or simply hovered over the tabernacle, but the word that he used frequently was the word filled. When the glory of God came and the cloud rested over the tabernacle and the glory entered the tabernacle, it filled every cubic inch of that place of meeting, so that if one entered into the tabernacle, they were immersed in the very presence of the glory of God. Now, as I said a moment ago when I read from Isaiah 6 that my focus on that text is usually elsewhere this afternoon. I want to look briefly at this one verse. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 
Semicolon. The whole earth is full of his glory. So that not only was the glory of God filling the tabernacle in a special redemptive way, the glory of God was present beyond the tabernacle, filling the whole earth. What an incredible concept that the glory of God fills this entire planet. The earth is full of it. You can't take a single step without being immersed in the fullness of the glory of God. And yet, we live in a time where people say that the human experience of our day is not a sense of the overwhelming presence of the glory of God, but that contemporary humanity has a profound sense of the absence of God. At the time of the Reformation, Luther talked about God's activity by which he reveals himself in Scripture and in nature, speaking of the Deus Revelatus, the revealed God. But he also says that where God reveals himself, he doesn't reveal everything that he could possibly reveal about himself all at one time, but that there is an addition to the Deus Revelatus, what Luther called the Deus Absconditus, the hiddenness of God. The word absconditus is brought over into the English word abscond. And when somebody embezzles funds from the bank and they abscond with that money, that means that they run away with it and they go into hiding because they don't want to be caught or captured or to be found with their hands stained with the guilt of stolen money. Now, there are those bank robbers who are not so bright. I heard one who absconded with the accounts payable. Do I have to explain that? I wish we would get such crooks coming to Ligon here who would steal our accounts payable. But if it's true, as the Bible says, that the whole earth is filled with His glory, why does anybody ever experience a sense of the Deus Absconditus, of the hiddenness of God? Why does it seem that His presence is absent from us. Why should somebody have to go to New York, to Niagara Falls, to catch a glimpse of the glory of God if the earth is full of it? Now, let me suggest a couple of reasons to explain this seeming paradox. Back in the middle of the 20th century, a Jewish philosopher by the name of Martin Buber wrote a book entitled The Eclipse of God. And in that book, this one who's the first to coin the existential phrase of an I-thou relationship with God explained that the dilemma and the predicament of modern humanity is this profound sense of the absence of God, whereby God is not plainly in sight. 
And I thought it was an interesting metaphor that he chose to describe that situation in terms of an eclipse. Because you're all familiar with what eclipses are in nature. We experience two kinds of them on a regular basis. We experience lunar eclipses and we experience solar eclipses. A lunar eclipse is the hiding of lunatic. No, it is the hiding of the moon. When the shadow, I guess, of the earth, I'm not an astronomer, I don't know how all this works, gets between us and the moon and the shadow obscures from our sight a portion or perhaps the entire face of the moon. And even more dramatic are those occasions when we are able to observe either partial or total eclipses of the sun. And when those events come to pass, we're always warned on the news and in the newspapers not to try to look directly at the sun during that time of eclipse, lest we do permanent damage to our eyes, and they give us indirect ways, fashioning certain boxes with mirrors and so on, that we can get a sort of a sideways glimpse of that, moon, or that sun even in eclipse, lest we are severely damaged by the brightness of the sun. Of course, when we talk about the glory of God in Scripture and its outward manifestation in terms of the consuming fire or the light, we are told that that light or brilliance or radiance or refulgence of divine glory is more intense than the sun itself. And if the light of the sun, if we view it directly, can possibly blind us, how much more damaging would it be to us if we looked directly, unveiled, unshielded from the naked brilliance of the glory of God. But when Buber used this imagery, of eclipse, he was saying it is, as it were, a dark shadow has passed over the face of God so that he has become virtually invisible to us. But I want us to remember that when an eclipse occurs, either of the moon or of the sun, Nothing about the nature of the moon or the nature of the sun has changed. During an eclipse, the moon is still there. During the eclipse of the sun, the sun is still there. The sun is shining as bright as it ever had. It's just that our view of it has been obscured by the shadow that passes over it. And so when we talk about the eclipse of God, we're not talking about the sense in which God has lost some of His eternal luster. Nothing has changed in the being of God. The only thing that has changed is our view of Him. And so again, the brilliant light of the divine glory is as radiant this afternoon as it was at the dawn of creation. It was as manifest in this world today as it was when the angels sang the Trisagion, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory. 
Let me take a moment to read from a book other than the Bible, one that is uninspired, errant, and fallible, barely, <laughs> from the Institutes of the Christian Religion, written by John Calvin. First of all, Calvin writes in the fifth chapter of Book One these words. Since the perfection of blessedness consists in the knowledge of God, He has been pleased in order that none might be excluded from the means of obtaining felicity, that's unbridled happiness, not only to deposit in our minds that seed of religion of which we have already spoken, but so to manifest His perfections in the whole structure of the universe and daily place Himself in our view that we cannot open our eyes without being compelled to behold Him. His essence indeed is incomprehensible, utterly transcending all human thought. But on each of His works, His glory is engraven in characters so bright, so distinct, so illustrious that no one, however dull and illiterate, can plead ignorance as their excuse. Before I read the next citation from the magisterial reformer, let me recall a, an experience I had in my doctoral studies at the Free University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. One of the modules that I had to study was in the field of the theology of missions. And one of the books that I had to read for that study was written by Bovink. No, not Herman Bovink, of the great systematician, but rather from Johannes Bovink. And Bovink talks in that book about God's manifesting Himself to the whole world through what we call general revelation as the Apostle Paul explains in the first chapter of Romans, where Paul says that from the creation of the world, God's eternal power and deity is made manifest, phoneros, clearly revealed to every person on this planet, and that therefore we are without excuse if we fail to embrace the God who is. Well, I was surprised when Bovink made the observation, again, please don't confuse this with Herman Bovink, I don't want to sully his good reputation. But Johannes Bovink said that, yes, there is this divine revelation that God gives clearly and manifestly to the whole world, but because of our sinful condition, because of what theologians call the noetic effects of sin, the effect of sin on our minds by which our minds are darkened, that general revelation never gets through. It can't break through the barrier of our <coughs> pride and fallenness by which we are so blinded by the prince of the power of the air that we actually can't see it. So it is with this fullness of the glory in this earth. It's there, but we don't see it because we can't see it. And when I read that from Johannes Bovink, I thought, is he reading the same epistle to the Romans that I'm reading? 
Does not the apostle in that same chapter say that the reason why none is without excuse and why they are all exposed to the wrath of God is because while they were knowing God, they refused to honor Him as God, neither were they grateful. Paul goes on and talks about how our foolish minds are darkened and all the rest, and we're not going to dispute that. But the very foundation for the exposure of all human beings to the judgment of God is not because we don't see it, it's because we do see it. And we do come to at least a cognitive knowledge of the majesty of God. Now, Paul elsewhere to the Corinthians says we don't spiritually discern it. We may have a cognitive awareness of it, but we don't know it in a saving way, and that's certainly true. But just because we don't know it in a saving way does not, know, does not mean that we don't know God in a cognitive way, as if we had no glimpse at all of His manifest glory. No eclipse is strong enough to extinguish the manifestation of God's glory that fills the entire earth. We look at it with myopic eyesight, we pass by it and are hardened to it go out of our way to avoid it, and in our natural state when we know it, our instinct is to repress it, to deny it, and to exchange the truth of God for a lie. It's interesting to me that in the science of comparative religion, that wherever you go on the face of this earth, to whatever culture you examine, as Heinrich Kramer and Mercedes Eliade have done extensively, they have found in the most primitive tribes some form of religion. And indeed, religion is so persistent within the human race that some have said that it is better to define man not in terms of being homo sapiens, but as being homo religiosus. That is, we are incurably religious. However, the religion that we discover is the very shadow that obscures the glory of God. Because what the world is filled with is idolatrous religion. Religion that exchanges the truth of God for a lie that trades the glory of God for the glory of creatures. Several years ago, I witnessed a television interview between David Frost and Madeline Murray O'Hara. And David Frost, on this occasion, was fighting for the angels defending the premise of the existence of God, which of course was utterly odious to Madeline Murray O'Hara. And as they didn't seem to be getting much progress in the discussion, David Frost, being British, decided to settle the issue in the good old-fashioned American way by taking a poll and counting noses and subjecting himself to the ad populum informal logical fallacy. But he turned to the studio audience and he said to them, how many of you believe in some kind of higher power, something greater than yourself, some kind of supreme being? And every single person in the audience raised their hand. And David Frost turned to Madeline Murray O'Hara and kind of smugly smirked at her and said, see? Now at this point, Madeline Murray really 
shocked me by her response. Here's how she offered a rebuttal to David Frost's studio poll. She said, well, what do you expect from the hoi polloi, these uneducated imbeciles that are, you know, and she just attacked the intelligence of those who voted for the existence of God. That's not what I expected her to do. I thought she would be more sophisticated. I thought she would have turned and said, well, you've answered his question of how many of you believe in God in terms of some higher power, supreme being, something greater than yourselves? What are you talking about? Cosmic dust? Atomic energy? Some higher power dynamite that you believe in? Let me ask the question a different way. Let me frame it. How many of you believe in Yahweh? the God of Israel, the God who seeks to bind you absolutely with His law and threatens you with eternal hell's fire punishment if you don't embrace Jesus as the only way of salvation. She didn't ask that question. But I wonder what the vote would have been if that supreme being or higher power had been given a biblical identity. Because as soon as the identity of the God of all glory is made manifest, then the work of idolatry begins in earnest. It was Calvin who said that fallen humanity is a fabricum idolarum, an idol factory. We don't just have a few idols handmade out of stone or wood, but we are now sophisticated enough to be engaged in the mass production of them. Back now, if we may, to Calvin. I'm reading a passage now from chapter 5 in book 1 that is a very famous citation from Calvin. You know, sometimes it drives me nuts when I I write a book or try to write a book and submit it for uh, publication and the editor comes back and sees that I've quoted Luther at such and such a place and they say, where is that quote? (laughs) And I say, (laughs) where's that quote? How many thousands of pages of Luther have I read And I know Luther wrote that. I know it as well as I know my own name, but I can't begin to tell you where. And Vesta came with me the other day. She's helping to proofread a a new expository commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, and it's like 750 pages long, and the publisher sends it for our you know, they give flags of asking questions, and I had quoted Herman Melville in that manuscript where I said Herman Melville once said that it's not until we understand that one grief outweighs a thousand joys that we will ever learn or become what Christianity is trying to make us. And the publisher says, Give the source. I think I've read, oh, there's one of the South Sea adventure stories of Melville that I didn't read, but I've read the entire Melville corpus, and that was 50 years ago. Okay, Vesta says, where's this quote from? I said, well, it's not from Moby Dick. I said, I think it's either <clears throat> from Billy Budd or Redburn. But I don't know which, and I couldn't begin to tell you where. She said, well, how are we going to do this? I said, well, I'll see if I can look it up on the Internet. The Internet is like that guy behind the screen in The Wizard of Oz. It knows everything, right? 
I'm just starting to learn how to do this stuff. I actually Googled something, Chris, believe it or not. Yeah, the sky's falling. I, and I put in my Google, Melville quote, and then I wrote the quote. You got it? And what comes up but a reference to famous Melville quotes. And there's my quote. I said, Eureka, there it is. Now, where is it in Melville? Google didn't give me the source. <laughs> Can you believe that? They, re they cited the same quotation, but no matter what I looked for, they wouldn't tell me where it was from. I said, honey, I wrote a senior paper on Melville back in 1961, over 50 years ago. And if, I, if my memory serves me right, and it usually does, I say, I think I quoted that quote in that paper. If I can just find that paper. <laughs> so I had this personal trainer that comes to my house three days a week. You wouldn't know it by looking at me. <laughs> I'm not her poster child for <laughs> workouts. But we were working out and I was actually lifting weights and doing these reps. And while I was lifting weights, I was looking over my bookcase, and I saw this little blue uh, binder, and I said, just a minute, and I put the weights down, and I went over and I pulled this blue binder out, and there was my paper from 1961. I flipped it open. I went back to the, the footnotes in the back, and I saw the quote and the page number, and it was from Redburn. So I ran out to Vesta. I said, Vesta, here it is. Redburn, page 200 and whatever. So we solved that matter. Now, this quote from Calvin is one we hear again and again. And as much as I love John Calvin, and even if I question him today, as my professor once said, there's nothing I can say about Calvin today, good or bad, that could possibly destroy the felicity that he enjoys in heaven right now. So I can't be offending him if I question this citation. But let me read it to you, and then I'll tell you what my question is. But as the greater part of mankind, enslaved by error, walk blindfold in this glorious theater, he exclaims that it is a rare and singular wisdom to meditate carefully on the works of God, which may seem sharp-sighted, which many who seem sharp-sighted in other respects behold without profit. It is true that the brightest manifestation of divine glory finds not one genuine spectator among a hundred. Still, neither his power nor his wisdom is shrouded in darkness. His power is strikingly displayed when the rage of the wicked to all appearance irresistible is crushed in a single moment their arrogance subdued, their strongest bulwarks overthrown, their armor dashed to pieces, etc. So Calvin is saying in the history of divine providence, in addition to general revelation, God has so clearly manifested himself, just as the Apostle Paul said, that the universe itself, as the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows forth his handiwork, that this universe Calvin describes as a glorious theater. It's not like God has hidden clues behind rocks or in the dirt waiting for some brilliant erudite theologian to discover these clues of his glory. No, 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 no. It's a theater filled with the glory of God 
not one in a hundred sees it. Because Calvin says, man walks into this theater and through this theater blindfolded. Blindfolded. Dr. Calvin, you're starting to sound like Johannes Bobbing to me. People that are blindfolded can't see what's on the screen. But the problem with man is that he does see what's on the screen. But he hates what he sees. And nobody taught that more vividly than John Calvin. So I've, I've always been disturbed by that image of the blindfold, unless we say it this way, that God, the human beings in their sinfulness, walk into this glorious theater where in panoramic 360-degree screen is displaying vividly and brilliantly in high definition the glory of God. And when you see it, you pull out a handkerchief and use it as a blindfold and tie it across your eyes to make sure you can't see it. Now, if that's what Calvin means about people walking blindfolded through this glorious theater, I have no quarrel with the master from Geneva. And I think if he were here today, he would agree with what I'm quibbling over here. Because Calvin knew as well as anybody that that general revelation got through. And so let me give you this last quotation from him. Bright, however, as is the manifestation which God gives both of himself and his immortal kingdom in the mirror of his works, so great is our stupidity, so dull are we in regard to these bright manifestations that we derive no benefit from them. We don't look at him, but rather overlook him. And with regard to supernatural events, those these are occurring every day, how few there are who see them to be the ruling providence of God, how many who imagine that they are casual results produced by the blind evolutions of the wheel of chance. Now, that's Calvin's explanation for the eclipse of God in our world. And as I said, when I started to recite passages from him, that this was from a book that was fallible and errant, now let's look at a book that is neither fallible nor errant but is the very Word of God. Let me ask you to turn to the Gospel according to St. John to the third chapter. Perhaps you don't even need to open your Bibles at this point because I want to start reading at John 3, 16. Have you ever heard of that text? I'm sure that you do. I'll bet you could recite it. No? I bet you could, you just don't want. A plus. Now, do you want to take that A plus and go home? Do you want to take the A plus that I'm giving you and quit now? Or would you like to continue on and try to get an A++? <laughs> what do you say? You want to play? You want to quit or you want to play? You're smart. You're smarter than I thought. Good job on John 3.16. Now let's go on. How about John 3? 17. 
Anybody know that one? I'll help you. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. This is good news, isn't it? Okay, let's go to 3.18. For he who believes in Him is not condemned. Still good news. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now John introduces the terrifying notion of divine condemnation into this section of the good news. But he doesn't leave us asking why, really, this condemnation. Because he answers his, his own question by saying in verse 19, this is John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than the light. This is the condemnation, that glory of God that shines in this glorious theater, that is seen most brilliantly in the incarnation, that light came into the world. But the men received it not because they preferred darkness rather than the light. One of my favorite stories written by Herman Melville is a little short story called Bartleby the Scrivener. How many have ever read Bartleby the Scrivener? One? Who's that? Is that George? There's another one. Another one. I can have an all recall here in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Bartleby the Scrivener is of this employee who works as a clerk, and his boss is very demanding, and Bartleby is a Mr. Milk Toast. He's very weak, malleable, and his boss pushes him around all the time. And one day the boss comes in and gives an order to Bartleby, and Bartleby answers the boss when the boss tells him to do something, Bartleby says, I would prefer not to. The boss says, what? Bartleby says, I would prefer not to. And no matter how loud and strong the command came from the boss, poor little Bartleby would sit there and just simply say, I would prefer not to. I'll never forget that because we were given the assignment to read it in this class I was taking in American literature. And on the next day, when we came to Bartleby, the professor looked at me and he said, Mr. Sproul, would you give us your analysis of Bartleby the Scrivener? And I didn't hesitate. I said, I would prefer not to. <laughs> <laughs> And so what John is saying is when the light comes in, in our fallen humanity, we have a preference for darkness. Do we want to look at the glory of God that fills the world in our fallen estate, dear friends? we would prefer not to. That's why the Bible calls us children of darkness. 
and calls us out of the darkness into the glorious light of the things of God. Now this final question, why would any creature be stupid enough to prefer darkness over light? I was doing a radio interview with the late great Dr. James Montgomery Boyce in Philadelphia one afternoon and we were talking about this and we were looking at this and Jim looked at me and he says, oh, R.C., why is it that men prefer the darkness over the light? And I said, because their eeds are devil. <laughs> that was the end of that taping. It took us five minutes to stop laughing at my misspeak. Our eeds are devil. Every time I come to this text, my fallen brain almost automatically says that our eeds are devil. <laughs> but what the Bible says is that the reason we love the darkness rather than the light is because our deeds are evil. And we know that the light will expose us. It'll bring the things that we hide in the darkness into the light. That's why we put the blindfold on. In his prodigious work of being in time, I'm sorry, being in nothingness, Jean-Paul Sartre writes about why he doesn't believe in the existence of God. And he says that if we are free, our freedom makes the existence of God impossible. A Dutch philosopher by the name of Leipen responded to that assertion by the French existentialist Sartre. And he said this, he said, Sartre said that, that human freedom makes the denial of God necessary or impossible. Leipen said, Sartre's morality makes the denial of the existence of God necessary. Saying Sartre cannot possibly justify his own lifestyle in a universe governed by God. So either the creature has to change or God has to go. And so if there is an eclipse, it's not because God is changed or even in hiding, not because He's penurious in His gift of self-manifestation. He has poured out the glory of His eternal being throughout the creation. You can't open your eyes and not see it. And if you miss it, it's because you want to miss it. If you don't see the glory of God every second of the day all around you, it's because you can't stand to watch it. And if that's the case, it means you're still a child of darkness. But when we come out of the darkness and into the light and the Holy Spirit of truth takes the scales from our eyes and the blindfold from off our head, we can behold His glory. 
Let's pray. Oh, how glorious, oh God, are your works, each one of which redounds to the glory of your being. Give us eyes to see and hearts to delight in the refulgent majesty of your glory. Amen.